All right, so my name is Spencer Mactor, and I am here to present how I learned to stop worrying and love the smart meter. Uh, it's my first time here at B-Side, so like he was saying, it's actually a really, really nice conference, and so I'm really happy to be here. And also, like he was saying, less so on the getting fired, but more so about getting sued with uh, my particular topic, because a lot of power industries are really into this, so we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So. Uh, first up, this is the agenda. This is going to be what we're going over. Uh, three main topics. We're not going to spend quite so much time on the first two, but first off, we're going to talk about uh, smart meters and the role that they play in the bigger picture. The bigger picture, in this case, being advanced metering infrastructure. So we're going to talk about what that is briefly and go over that. Before I get too in-depth into it, is there anybody in the audience that actually works for a power company, service provider, anything like that? You? Okay. So just wanted to spot you out, so if you come try to approach me afterwards, I'll have that in mind. All right, so um, after we talk about what they are and the role that they play, we're going to go over why, why we care, why we're here, because this is the whole point of why we are here. Why do we want to attack them? So we're going to talk about uh, the information that's being stored on the devices, how it's being transferred, and why, why we care. And then at the very end, we're going to go over how we actually attack the meter. This is going to be, of course, my favorite part. So we're going to talk about um, mechanisms uh, over the wired and the wireless access and the tools that we need to use. And then at the very end, I'm going to demonstrate uh, Terminator, which is the program that I released last week to attack smart meters over the optical interface. And I'm going to actually demonstrate that. Uh, if you've noticed, I actually don't have a smart meter with me. There is a whole whole large problem with that. I have about eight smart meters back at the office, but between the ones that required a 240 volt connection into the wall, like the type your dryer runs off of, and the fact that the ones that just require the uh, 120 volt to plug into like a normal outlet, it's really hard to find one that's actually a like smart meter that we could use that'd be suitable for the testing. So I'm actually going to run it remotely from back to the office and I have a picture of one of the smart meters I'll actually be testing with. Once again, I apologize that I would, am not able to have one here. I was also worried about getting it through the TSA, but that'd be a whole other issue that I was willing to tackle. But So we're going to go over that demo. We'll be running that remotely. All right. So first off, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Spencer McIntyre. Uh, as I mentioned before, I work for Secure State. I used to be on their profiling team in which I did uh, penetration testing. I still do a lot of that. Um, I spend about half of my time still doing profiling work, still doing pen tests, uh, web application assessments, things like that. So that's a lot of what I do. But what I'm actually, uh, the team I'm actually a part of is the research and innovation team. This is a team we just recently put together and it is to do primarily special projects. So. That is what I specialize in. I do a lot of these special projects. So when we have uh, engagements coming from power industries, places like that, where we do have to do assessments on smart meters, things like that. Um, we also do things with uh, other uh, tool development for the profiling team for when they come up with something that they need to have. So I do most of the internal development um, as well as the penetration test uh, special projects. So all right, so it's enough about me. We're going to talk about the smart meters. So, First of all, um, have lots of pictures of smart meters in here because one of the points that I want to drive in this is that they are readily accessible and they are not going away quite to the contrary. They're currently still being deployed. So this is why we care, is that they are very easily accessible. Uh, one of my friends back at the office and I have taken almost all of the photos that you'll see in this uh, PowerPoint. So they're very easy to get your hands on. I'm sure many of us have probably noticed them. Back in Ohio, I don't know if it's different around here, but back in Ohio, I see them more and more in commercial sectors. Not so much on residential houses, but they are there as well. They're still being deployed. I imagine some newer development areas, you'll probably see them more on residential houses. All right, so what is AMI? AMI uh, refers to the bigger picture of the advanced metering infrastructure. Now, this is the larger area, a larger topic that smart meters play a very small role in. So I just wanted to go over that to give you some sort of context as far as what we're looking at. So I've been to these types of conferences before. I've been to DEF CON, I've been to Black Hat before, and they've had quite a few talks on AMI, AMI as a whole, and they'll talk about the uh, remote systems, things like that. But we want to really just focus on the smart meters. So AMI, it refers to the infrastructure that allows gas, water, and electric meters to communicate back to the service providers. And when I refer to as the service providers, I'm talking about the companies that you are paying for your electricity or your gas or your water. That's who I'm referring to as the service provider. 
So there's going to be the service providers that are actually utilizing the smart meter that are providing power, gas to uh, utility companies, and then there's going to be the manufacturers of the smart meters themselves. So we'll discuss those in a little bit, but I just want to let you know that those are what I'm referring to. Uh, the big thing about AMI is that we have two-way communication with the smart meter and the utilities companies. So the utilities companies can push out configurations to the smart meters as well as retrieve information such as readings. This is a big thing because years and years ago before this infrastructure was in place, someone would have to go out to the electrical meters, write down the numbers, because we all have, or some of us have seen like the older electrical meters that have like the dials on them, so we have to write that information down. That's how you got billed, is somebody actually had to physically go out, do these readings. So we don't have to do that anymore. This is the 21st century, and the smart meters that are being deployed are replacing that older infrastructure, so we can do this remotely. All right, so the smart meters, like I said, are a component in the smart grid. The smart grid refers to the actual interactions of everything within the AMI infrastructure. All right, and then, like I said, uh, remote readings, configuration is a big part of this. So um, here's a nice uh, diagram. This is very high level. So what we have here is we have the smart meters over here on the left, the large companies, and over here on the left, large companies, and the general customers, both using uh, smart meters. Um, the reason why public network and internet are kind of different here, although, I mean, of course, the internet is a public network, but the public network can also include uh, cellular signals. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into the uh, wireless section. But then we have our service provider, which are going to be the utilities companies. So smart meters are communicating back via a number of methods to the billing systems, uh, the web systems, things like that. And then those are all accessible over the internet. So uh, there's a ton of information out there about these. We are just focusing on the smart meters themselves over there on the left. So that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on the security problems that they have and the risk that they can potentially provide to the service providers. All right, so not sure how much of you, how many of you are aware of the older methods that were being employed to steal power. Um, this is one of the older electrical meters. You can still see the dials right there. Uh, the picture's really bad, I apologize, but it's very old. But um, what people used to do to attack smart meters is they would put um, magnets on either side. This is very, very old, but they put magnets on either side, and what that would do is that would slow down the amount of times that the internal uh, mechanism would rotate, which would then uh, slow down how often you'd be billed. So you could use more power and you wouldn't be billed for as much. So this is a picture I could find of somebody actually doing this. And um, so the information that I found from USA Today while I was doing my research, they were estimating that in the U.S. alone, about $6 billion in worth of power is being stolen each year. This was from, I think it was about 2010, but this was uh, USA Today, basically going off of how many times they found cases of people that were stealing power. They determined that it was about $6 billion, and that's just in the US. It's a much larger problem in other countries, such as Mexico, I, I know, was one that I repeatedly saw in the news while I was doing my research. And so other, company, uh, other countries, are, uh, this is a very large problem, is people stealing power. So, AMI is uh, being deployed to a lot of uh, different locations still, so smart meters are still being put out and the older meters are being replaced by these ones. One of the reasons why these meters are being deployed is that they are being deployed under the assumption that they will make these types of very basic attacks very difficult. Um, well, not di necessarily difficult, but you, you can't do them anymore because it's a different type of mechanism internally that's monitoring the power. but. All they're doing is making it more difficult, and so hopefully when we release a tool like Terminator, they're going to understand that you still have to put security mechanisms in place. You can't just alter the internal device and assume that like the older style attacks aren't going to work. It's just making it more difficult for people. So there's going to be a new generation of people out there that are actually capable of stealing power. So this is another picture. This was on the side of an apartment building. Uh, this is a newer apartment uh, complex, and all of those meters right there are all smart meters. Those little gray dots that you can see are the optical interfaces, just freely available. This was a gated community, but other than that, anyone in the public can walk over and connect to one of these devices. And I did so. I went over and I connected to one of them, and I was working on it for about an hour, hour and a half, uh, authorized, of course. But nobody said anything. The police aren't going around. They don't really know what you're doing. Nobody. Nobody is going to think twice when they see somebody over there. So, all right, why do we want to attack smart meters? Um, I had to ask myself this question, but it really comes down to the same two reasons that we attack anything else. 
it's either going to be the data on the device that we want or we want to alter, or it's gonna be that the device has some sort of access that we don't have that we want to be able to exploit and use to gain other information or other access. So it's the same two reasons we attack anything else. Um, and like I've been showing with the pictures, consumers have physical access to these devices. If it's on the side of your own house and you're one of the people that are lucky enough to have one of these, I highly doubt that anyone's going to say anything if they see you there for hours and hours hooked up to this device that's on the side of your house. They assume that if you're the owner of the house, you're authorized to be there. So anything, any device that has physical access to, we all know from within computers that you can't, they can't be trusted. The security on the device is should be assumed to be compromised when people have physical access to it. And these smart meters are no different. So, all right, the information that's being on the device. So meters are storing usage information. That's their primary function. So the type of information that's being stored on the device is how much electricity is being used and a lot of times at what time of day. That's a very critical component because a lot of the utilities companies are moving towards a TOU or time of use billing model. And what that means is that I don't know the hours off the top of my head, but between say 5 p.m. and 9 p.m., which are, if those are the peak usage hours for when everyone's coming home, everyone's using their stove to cook, things like that, they will charge you more money because that is when power is in the most demand. So the time of use is going to refer to that. So um, why would an attacker want this information? Um, there's a few different reasons. Uh, fraud is of course the first one that comes to everybody's mind. If you can alter the information that's on the device, you can be billed for using less electricity than you actually have been. So you can do that. Um, one of the things that I've actually found is that law enforcement companies are actually using the electrical usage information to find residential homes that are being used for drugs. Because what will happen is people that are growing marijuana will have a very high electrical usage because of all the lamps that they have to cultivate the plants. So by finding that information out and seeing that it's very steady because they always have the lights on at a certain time. Uh, pr uh, law enforcement is using this to profile which homes might be potential uh, drug houses, specifically for growing medical mar uh, marijuana or other, other drugs. So next up is going to be uh, the access. Like I was saying, the meters have two-way communication. So there's uh, two primary ways, in my experience, that the meters can communicate back to the utilities companies. These are both going to be uh, wire, uh, wireless methods, and that's going to be over a cellular connection and over a Zigbee. We'll talk about Zigbee a little bit later on. We're actually talking about us accessing the device. Um, in the case that the meters are communicating back over cellular signal, the meters will have a SIM card inside the device. It's the same type of connection that our phones use. They'll have a 3G connection back to the utilities company and there'll be a sort of private network connection that allows the smart meters to phone back and report the usage information that they have as well as uh, retrieve configuration files if there's anything new. Uh, one of the companies that I've done work for, they have their smart meters and they will, any smart meter can be deployed and once it gets deployed and it turns on, it'll phone back and for the first time retrieve its configuration to configure itself. So uh, sort of like, um, so it, it can also be used to automatically configure the meters when they turn on. So uh, like I said, they can have either direct internet access, so uh, be able to retrieve the information back that way, but what I see more often than not is they'll have a private network uh, through whatever cellular company they're using, like such as Verizon. All right, so case study. This is probably the, this is gonna be the uh, first vulnerability or attack case that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, once again, consumers have physical access to these devices. That SIM card that's inside has to be assumed to be compromised. So there's nothing to stop anyone from taking down their smart meter and cracking it open like I've, I've shown here in this picture. And there's information that you need in order to be able to use your SIM card to connect back to it as the way the smart meter would. Essentially trying to impersonate the smart meter itself by removing the SIM card from the device. So the information that we need right here is uh, the APN um, and sometimes the username and password. In the case where I was able to do this, I was able to find that um, in my particular case, the username and password was not set. And I was very lucky that when I did my assessment, the smart meter that I had had internal network access. Uh, this was huge for me because what I was able to do is I was able to take one of their smart meters that they provided to us to perform the assessment on, able to open it up, take out the SIM card, and able to put that into my laptop, connect up to their network as the smart meter would have. 
Once I was on that network, I was able to contact uh, their billing systems via their IPs. I, was, I had essentially a VPN connection. I was issued a private address. I could not communicate with other smart meters because they claimed to have had that firewalled off, but I was able to communicate with their billing system. Their billing system had a very, very common configuration error that was, and there was a publicly available exploit for it, and I was able to exploit their billing system remotely from the connection and point of view that their meter would have been able to. And the only thing I could possibly find that would prevent me from doing that is that the APN is very, very difficult to find. There, when I was doing Google searches, because the client had provided it to me, I was trying to find if I was an attacker, how would I have been able to find this APN to validate this attack that a unknowing attacker could do. A lot of times, if you can guess that the service provider is, say, a Verizon or at &T, Verizon or at &T issues that APN to the uh, customer, in this case, the utilities company, and a lot of times it follows a basic naming convention. So that was the closest thing I could find, but essentially that APN is the only thing that's preventing someone from activating the SIM card and impersonating the smart meter. So this was a very large problem. Now, in this picture that I have right here, this white chip right here that my shadow is pointing on is actually a uh, Motorola chip. That is the chip that uh, has the, um, uh, the SIM card in it with communications back to the utilities company. So I was able to just crack that meter open and take that out. Furthermore, when I was done, I was able to put the SIM card back in and reconstruct the meter and is able to work just fine. So not really that difficult. And the anti-tamper mechanisms on the smart meters in this particular case was just a little metal twist tie. I've never competed in the uh, anti-tamper competition that they have at DEF CON, but I'm pretty sure if I was able to subvert this, somebody else with some time that I actually wanted to put into it could just as easily do the same thing. So that was the first real problem that we had, that we were able to find. So now we're going to talk about uh, additional attack vectors. This is probably my favorite picture that I have, and this is the picture that is going to most closely represent the meter that I will be doing my testing from remotely. Um, so this is a uh, meter that we have in our test enclosures, that large gray box, and then we have our optical interface, this little cable that's connected to it right there. It goes off to a laptop, and I'll be uh, remoting into one of those to perform a test on one of these devices. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures because I could, I found that I was able to modify the data on it to show uh, the display information because there's a table when going through the standards that has uh, the display information. So I was able to made, make the reader read 666, but that was just one of my personal favorites. All right. So, when we're talking about accessing the meters, there's a few different ways that we can do this. We have uh, the wired interface, which is going to be the optical interface, which we talked about last. And that's uh, what was shown in this picture right here. We have the wired interface and uh, the two different uh, wireless technologies that are typically being used. There's Zigbee, which we'll talk about next, and the cellular signal, which we did just talk about. Um, a lot of us. Uh, not all the time. Sometimes uh, devices can have both the cellular and the Zigbee, but what happens a lot of times is that companies will have just one or the other because, of course, different additional hardware costs, and they're both kind of sort of used for the same thing. So first off, we're going to talk about Zigbee and uh, what it is. So Zigbee is a low-power, low-cost wireless mesh network. This is very ideal for using with smart meters because uh, the mesh-based architecture, if one of the meters goes down because somebody disconnects it or there's just some type of problem with it, because of the mesh network, it's not really going to prevent the information from being distributed as it would. So it's very redundant. And then the uh, low power and low cost also come into effect because these meters are going to be deployed thousands and thousands at a time. Um, the low power is actually a really nice feature. It doesn't necessarily affect smart meters because smart meters have uh, an internal power supply, but on other devices, in order to pass the Zigbee certification and actually be a Zigbee certified device, your device has to be able to prove that it can run on, on a battery. I think it's for like 18 months or something ridiculous like that, but it, it, they're really, really serious about the low power that it has to be able to function for very long periods of time. All right, um, like I said, uh, the mesh network makes it uh, reasonably reliable for using with the actual smart meters themselves. So why is Zigbee on the devices? Zigbee, um, although it, you can get a better wireless signal for it and uh, the distance is greater than that of wireless or uh, Wi-Fi, it's certainly not good enough for a residential meter to communicate back with utility providers. It's not meant for that. 
So there's a couple of different uh, reasons that Disney is on the device and a couple of different uses for it. Uh, one of them in the commercial sector is to allow uh, meters to communicate back with uh, consumer devices. These devices will show your electrical usage at the time and give you estimates on how much your electrical bill is going to be. So if you get billed on the 30th and it's the 20th and you're using a lot of power, you can know that you should turn off your TV or not run the dishwasher and other electronic appliances so that you can lower that cost and so that it doesn't surprise you when you actually do get the bill. It allows you to essentially monitor. Now, you can get these devices down at Home Depot and things like that. And that was just an example. This one right here is a thermostat that is also Ziggy enabled. So a lot of different consumer devices that allow you to uh, communicate with other things. So um, not really uh, used for intermeter communications, not directly, not in the sense that one meter needs to communicate with another. Now, because of the mesh technology, if one meter needs to communicate with uh, the target device, uh, with like a data collector, then uh, another meter will most likely have to retransmit that information. So the other meters are aware of the information, but they're not directly communicating with each other. Um, what I was talking about with uh, the data collectors is that um, as an alternative to providing a cellular connection to each one of the meters, what a lot of utility companies are doing is putting Zigbee radios in meters and then providing a single data collection unit. And what happens is all the meters in the range will provide this data back to the centralized data collection utility, and that will have a uh, cellular connection back to utility something reported back that way. So it makes it easier because they don't have to have quite so many uh, cellular signals out there, so it's a little bit less overhead. So the uh, meters are all talking back to the centralized unit, which then reports the data back to utility and stuff. Thing. All right, so it's all background on Zigbee. So now we're gonna talk about access, actually uh, accessing uh, meters with Zigbee. So these are a couple of things to, uh, to keep in mind. So uh, in order to be able to communicate with uh, the devices over Zigbee, it's very similar to Wi-Fi in the sense that you have to associate with the device. You can't just randomly send off information. And with the security implementations that have been put into place, replaying uh, packets is not typically a viable option in the employments that I've seen because a lot of the uh, utilities companies are using uh, encryption, things like that. So uh, the pairing window and the encryption are going to be the two things that you really need to uh, look at when you're trying to actually communicate with one of these devices, assuming that you're not authorized, of course. Um, pairing window is controlled by the service provider. So if you go out to Home Depot and you buy one of the thermostats or one of the modern, uh, monitoring uh, disks, uh, LCD, they have like little LCD screens on them, you call up your utilities company and say, hey, I bought this, can I want to sync it up to my meter? And your utilities company will have to put your meter into pairing mode. That's if it's not already in pairing mode. They'll have to put it into pairing mode so that you can sync this device with the meter and associate it with that network so that they can communicate with each other. Now, the pairing window is very interesting because that is often configured by the service providers and not all the service providers agree on what a suitable time frame is to allow that pairing window to be open because they control that. Uh, some of the device manufacturers are claiming that the pairing window should just always be on, it should just be infinitely open and so anybody given the proper security key of one thing in place should be able to associate with uh, the devices over Zigbee. Uh, other places are saying that's not good at all. We need to decrease the range down to about one week, or some people are saying even like a few days. But what I see a lot of times is one week. One week seems to be the pretty standard size for the pairing window. So when somebody calls up and wants it to be opened, it's typically open for about one week. All right. Um, now on to the uh, security that's in place on Zigbee. So uh, Zigbee uses a Encrypt, uh, it uses AES encryption, and it can be uh, configured in a few different ways. It can have either no encryption and no integrity check. Uh, the data can be encrypted. The data can be encrypted with an integrity check, or only an integrity check can be provided. So the integrity check is going to help to prevent against replay attacks, things like that. But of course, if the uh, information is encrypted, then a lot of times that will suffice to prevent against replay attacks. So. Uh, using tools in the Kill B framework um, and to just like blindly replay information is not always going to be the most effective uh, way to communicate with the devices. Um, keys can be either negotiated ahead of time or distributed. A lot of times the meters will have a static key that is in, uh, in their configuration that's pushed down by the service providers. This is service provider control, not necessarily from the manufacturer, but a lot of times the service providers will set those. 
All right. Um, next up. So when we're actually looking at the Zigbee on the devices, um, most common Zigbee attack tools can kill a bee. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, kill a bee and how we're actually going to use that. So ZB Stumbler is going to be the utility of choice for actually finding the meters because when you have a meter without actually opening it up, you can't really tell if Zigbee is enabled or not. But by using ZB Stumbler, we can see what devices are on. We can determine the PAN IDs and the information that we need to start to profile the network. We can also see if there are different uh, mesh networks overlapping each other within the same physical uh, radius. And we can determine what devices are going where and what the there's a Zigbee term for it. I believe it's the router, and the, the Zigbee router is the lowest node that all the communication essentially goes through. And also, that <coughs> device is also the one that controls the uh, association process. All right, and then uh, finally, we're gonna look at, uh, uh, talk briefly about Zigbee Scappy. So Zigbee Scappy is actually a patch that I released uh, about a year ago that allows more fine-grained control and more fine-grained packet injection techniques with the Killaby framework. It's a SCAPI plugin interface that allows access to the Zigbee layers and allows access to the Zigbee library, or the, uh, excuse me, the Killaby libraries to inject and receive frames based on that. So using that, we can get a uh, live capturing going and uh, you know, inject. And most importantly, we have uh, encryption options because we can do both the AES with the CCM authentication check and without, so we have a bunch of different options there. So this is a showcase. Uh, that's kind of difficult to see. Can people see that just a little bit? A little bit, okay. It's on the uh, Killer Bee uh, bug, uh, bug tracking the uh, issues because whenever you submit a patch, you have to put it into the uh, issues. So if you want to take a look at it, it's up there. But I'm just gonna go over like what all this information is up here. So at the very top, uh, we can easily set the channel to what we want to inject on. So once we use ZB Stumbler and we determine what channel the uh, meters are on, we can adjust that in there. And then uh, right below that, we're going through and we are sniffing the information off of that and we're using the internal uh, SCAPI syntax and we're applying a function to it every time we receive a frame. So in this case, we're actually decrypting the information. So we pull that information or we pull those packets back out when we're done we can show them and we can write them to a PCAP file and we can replay those. We can send those packets out. And of course, before we resend them, we can modify any of the information that we want to. If we need to adjust the PAN ID or if we need to adjust the command that's being sent, anything like that, we can do that from within there. So this gives us a very low level uh, way to interact with the uh, devices and inject frames while also being able to see the responses back very quickly. Uh, since this patch has been uh, committed, this is in the main Killer Bee trunk. They've also added in an additional utility that will allow you to use a, a ton tap interface on Linux that you can watch the packets uh, in Wireshark. It's very, very helpful because that can help you uh, see the responses and things like that when you're injecting frames to see the smart meters responses. And also, uh, the code that I use here for the decryption and encryption is based on the Wireshark code. So that's all working internally very well. So it allows you to really get that fine grained control over the Zigbee communications with the meter. All right, so you've seen how we can, you've seen how we can interact with the meters over the Zigbee interface using the Killaby framework briefly, and then we talked about the potential flaws with using uh, SIM cards. Uh, now we're gonna talk about the wired access interface. This is the area where I've done the most uh, work in, and this is the area that my tool focuses on currently I'm gonna demonstrate. So uh, first off, how do we actually interact with the meter? We have to get a uh, ANSI Type 2 optical probe, which sounds really dirty, I know, but it's better than the uh, bus pirate that allows you to uh, dump the information off the device. I don't know if anybody's heard of the bus pirate, but that's probably some of the funnier things you've heard. Anyways, um, once we are connected to the device, there's a couple of different standards that we have to look at. That's the way that the devices are actually communicating to the, to the system over the optical interface. There's the C1218, which is defining the requests and responses, the formats of how the data is input and outputted. And then there's the C1219 standard, um, which is actually two different versions. Um, focusing on, there's the 1997 and the 2008 uh, C1219 standards, I believe. And that is dictating and defining how the data is actually stored on the devices within the table. So not how the data is being transmitted, but how the data is essentially at rest. There's also uh, additional 
uh, standards that determine how the information can be accessed over uh, modem connections. I believe that's C1221, or it might be 22, but um, those are going over uh, uh, over uh, modem connections over like telephone line, uh, tel uh, telephone connections. All right, so uh, C1218 is pretty simple, so I'm actually gonna skip over that. It's very much just dictating the codes for responses and requests to how, how you can actually like discuss uh, information with the device and pull information back out. Most of the information that we want to pull off is gonna be stored in the C1219 cable. So I'm gonna talk about that here. And what that is, is uh, C1219 has, uh, all the different tables are broken out into decades. Decades of 10. So these are the ones that I have listed right here are the ones that Terminator has the internal library support for. So there are uh, the general configuration information is stored in tables zero through nine. Uh, there's the security tables, which is number 40 through 49. And security tables are going to de um, control the access permissions for procedures and for other tables. So what users can do what, those are all set up in there. There is the history and event logs, which is 70 through 79, and there's the uh, telephone modem control. This can control how uh, different, allow different procedures to uh, initiate uh, phone calls and also to control what numbers are being used. You can uh, control the backup numbers, so the first one doesn't pick up, it can move on to the next one. And there's about 10 additional ones that are uh, defined by C1219 standard. The additional ones also revolve around how the information is being stored about the electrical usage. So because I am focusing on security uh, issues and potential flaws and security testing devices in general, I don't really have a whole lot of code done yet for actually parsing out, say, like kilowatt hours being used, things like that. So my focus has been primarily on finding security information, auditing the access controls, things like that. So that's why you see that reflected in Terminator. A lot of people are asking me, you know, like, how do I read how much uh, electricity is used my house is being used off? Or how can I use this tool to do that? The short answer is yes, but the long answer is you'll have to parse out that information yourself. So if you can do that, let me know, because I'd like to add that code in there. All right, physical connect, uh, physical equipment. All that is really needed is the optical, the uh, optical cable. So those are really expensive. I got mine from a company called Abacus Electronics, uh, and I think they're based out of England. I think I got mine on Amazon for maybe like four hundred fifty dollars, but I think they're marked on their site for about five hundred dollars. So it's really expensive equipment, but it is freely available. It's not regulated at all. Anybody can buy one of these cables as long as you have, as long as you have the money. I've seen a couple of articles online that go over how you can actually create them. They say you can create them for about $50 and in parts if you have some soldering experience. It's a little bit beyond me because I'm not really much of a hardware guy, so I just chose to buy mine. But if anybody gets one of these to work, please let me know. There's already somebody I've been uh, talking to uh, that wants to try to get one of these uh, homebrew cables to work. So. These cables use the infrared transceiver, uh, it uh, uses an infrared connection to that uh, that interface right there, which is where the cable actually hooks, hooks up to. Uh, once again, I apologize for not bringing a meter with me. I planned on showing you a meter, uh, the cable in person, but I wasn't able to do that because I needed to store it back at the office so that could be used for the demo. Uh, inside this interface, there are two infrared diodes, and those are just used for uh, transmitting and receiving information. So pretty simple that is about it for as far as the physical communication okay so finally we're going to talk about uh, Terminator this is the framework that I have written been working on for about eight months and we released it for the first time uh, been a public release last week anybody can get it it's uh, completely open source GPL v3 so anybody can get it modify it, please do. It's actually been downloaded a lot more than I was really even hoping for, so a lot of people are very interested in it. I'm very, very glad because it's been uh, really hard to get out there. So um, jumping right to it, this is the URL. If anybody wants to get it, please grab a hold of it. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, any issues uh, using it, uh, please send me an email. Um, I'm pretty good about responding. So. Um, what it is, is um, being a pen tester, I'm a huge fan of the Metasploit framework. Metasploit is awesome, and I don't want to learn to use another tool. Many of us here are probably very familiar with Metasploit. So uh, the user interface is modeled after Metasploit, and the internal architecture is truly a framework where you can add in modules and do things like that to enhance the functionality of it. It's all written in Python, though, and it's got the uh, full C1218 stack to send uh, requests and responses. We'll look into that uh, a little bit uh, in, during the demo. 
and it has a full C1219 library to um, parse the information out of the table so you actually know what you're looking at. So you can get the uh, procedures, you can get the log information, things like that. Okay, features. Um, like I said, it uh, interacts with smart meters uh, via a serial connection. So that optical interface that you have to have has to have a serial driver. So that's just how we use most of the ones I found out there. I have one that's over USB, but it has a uh, FTDI chip in it, which allows me to communicate with it over it as like a serial device. So um, the full version that we released last week, because we did a private release about a month ago, and that only had a couple of different modules in it. But the one we released last week that's publicly available right now has all of the modules that I have. Um, are in there. So there's 12 modules in total, which are ranging from uh, different, uh, allowing you to do different features and read information off the device, things like that. Uh, the modules mostly focus on reading and writing to the C1219 cables. I say that because any type of interaction you do with the smart meter is really, like 90% of it is going to be reading and writing to the C1219 cables. Um, that's where the information is stored. If you want to modify, of course, you're going to have to write to one. If you want to retrieve it, you're going to read from one. But even getting the, uh, the meter to do things, running procedures, things like that, are, is a series of reading and writing to tables. There is a special table called the procedure init table, which is in the general config decade. And when you want to have the meter do something like up, update the uh, ID and things like that, you write information to the procedure init table and you read the responses back from the procedure response table. So you can tell, um, this also allows you to run procedures asynchronously because you can start the procedure and the response will come back to you whether the procedure has been started successfully and then when you expect it to be done, you can read it out of the response table. A um, so diff couple different ways you can control that. But um, like I said, everything is really just reading and writing to the device to these tables specifically based on the deck. All right, so a uh, uh, couple of modules that we have in it is we have the basic information uh, module is the get info, which is what's actually being demoed over here in the uh, image. Um, so when we run this module, uh, we can tell what mode the meter is actually running in. Um, it's running in meter mode uh, or metering mode, which means that it's currently collecting information uh, from the house or whatever it's connected to, so it's recording that information. Uh, we have the hardware version, which is set by the uh, manufacturer. Uh, we can tell that this is an electrical meter as opposed to gas or water to store right there. Um, you have the uh, meter serial number, which is hard coded into the device. I, I've tried a couple of different things to try to see if I can write this information, but I, on my on the meters that I have tested on, I haven't been able to do that because it always responds back that that's an inappropriate action. But with the companies that I have worked with, they are, would be very concerned if you could change the serial numbers and device IDs because those are how the meters are actually being uniquely identified back to the company. It's not by the uh, by the meter uh, by the name. It, it's by the uh, the device ID. So if you can change your device ID to say your neighbor, then your neighbor will be billed for how much information they, or how much electricity you're using, presumably, because that's how it's being uniquely identified back to the utilities. No, uh, this is actually one of the meters that's very nice that um, you can access. Uh, a lot of these tables are in the general config table and in uh, the meters that I have uh, tested, there's been a few, the general config information can be retrieved by an unauthenticated user. So anybody can just read this information off the table uh, from those tables. Uh, going back to the, uh, the decades that the information is actually being stored in the C1219, um, a lot of the modules are focused uh, based on decades. So the get info is going to be the general config decade. Uh, you can be focusing on that one. There's also one to retrieve back uh, modem information, log information, and security information, which is all going to be uh, coordinating to those decades specifically. Probably one of the first modules that people are going to want to actually use when uh, doing some type of assessment with Terminator is going to be uh, the brute forcing authentication module. I, uh, Terminator sh uh, comes with a list in it that has a list of default passwords that I have found on meters and found through the documentation that I've read from the manufacturers of what the default passwords are being set to. So we should have pretty good luck if you run through that. It will find pretty much any password that's being set to the same uh, character over and over again. Um, one thing that I want to note on passwords is that the passwords are not ASCII values. The passwords are actually can be a uh, hex. The only limit on the passwords is that they have to be 20 bytes long, but um, when we're going through the brute forcing uh, module in the demonstration here in just a second, uh, you'll see that the input list uh, provides them all in hex, but if you want to do uh, ASCII values, you can adjust that within the module so you can run a normal 
uh, word list and Terminator will just pad that value out with zero. So beware of that if you're gonna do that because the value has to be 20 bytes long because that's actually dictated by the C1218 protocol for how the, uh, how the users authenticate. Sorry, what was that? No, 20 bytes exactly. It cannot be longer. Um, a lot of times what I've seen is uh, on some of the um, some of the ones I've done is the first ten bytes will be like zero one zero one zero one in hex, and then the last ten bytes will just be zeros. So uh, the uh, default word list that comes with that uh, ha will have those in there. So it'll have like twenty bytes of like all the same. So you can take a look at that. Um, and then also the included modules that we have are uh, basic raw abilities to read and write to tables. So you can uh, modify tables that you want. Uh, read, uh, read their exact values, things like that. And finally, okay, so um, the modules require some information to be used because going back to what I was talking about where it's all reading and writing the information to the device, you really kind of have to know the proper format for the uh, information that you're writing to the device. And this is all controlled by the C1218 and C1219 standards. So even with this tool, it's not quite script kitty ready yet. You can't just run through it and say, clear out all of my usage information for how much electricity my house is using. You can't do that just yet because, like I said, um, I've taken this from the perspective of I need to do a pen test on smart meter, what tools do I need? That's not exactly something that I need because as long as I can provide to my client that I can read and write to the tables, bypassing authentication, that's typically good enough for them because they can infer what that actually means. So you do have to have uh, some good amount of knowledge about the internal workings and the protocols in order to be able to use the tool efficiently. Uh, procedures, like I said, can be tricky. Um, read the documentation from those. There's a lot of them that are documented. There are standard procedures uh, that are documented by uh, C1219. And then there's a whole other section for manufacturer specific procedures. So those ones are not documented. And I have not had a whole lot of luck trying to find documentation from the manufacturers themselves. Of course, being that I don't buy these meters, they're not very inclined to work with me on that. All right, um, so some of the modules that we have, some of the higher level modules is uh, changing uh, the meter's ID and uh, setting the operation mode. The operation mode one is kind of interesting. I'll show you that in the demo because certain tables can be read only when the meter is in a specific mode. Let's go over that. Um, this, so uh, common security issues with uh, Terminator. Terminator is very much focused on finding uh, and ensuring that access controls and authentication is properly implemented. Um, so going back to what I was talking about with the general config tables, you can read the information from the general config tables without being properly authenticated. It's an issue that I found in a couple of different meters. Funny thing is, though, is you still have to send a password, the meter responds back that your password is inaccurate, but then you can read the information out of the general config table. Don't know how that works or what sense that makes, but that is one of the issues that I found. Um, a lot of, uh, the, another problem I found is that meters ignore the user name and the user ID field. So this is me running the brute forcing module, and this is with the default word list. So the username is the same, and the user ID is also the same, but you can authenticate with different passwords. So this makes brute forcing a lot easier on these uh, on these ones that have this particular issue. You would assume that once the password was found that you wouldn't find it anymore because only one password per user, but that's not the case. And then something else that I've noticed, uh, I have not found any meter or I've not read anything about any types of meters that will lock out the users after X number of failed authentication attempts. The worst that I found is that they will start to log that information in the logging table. But if you're successful and you get access to the meter, it's possible that you might be able to clear out the locks. And unless that information has already been uh, gathered by the utilities company, you should be all through. So, or if you remove the SIM card, then it has no way to phone back to utilities companies anyway. So the local logs on the device, not very accessible. So the effectiveness of actually logging failed access attempts to the meter itself, in my opinion, not very good. All right, so now here's the part that I'm very excited about is gonna actually uh, demo the tool. Yeah. 
So uh, we can see uh, without having to touch an object, we can actually, so that's a problem that uh, we did in earlier versions of uh, Mac OS that I see a lot of the problems there, but it's not like a bad way to do it. Just a uh, idea that can facilitate presentation. Um, but we can uh, run such features like here using this, and we'll actually provide that. We have a couple of uh, examples. So um, running the uh, git info module, we can actually train this as an initial here. So we can train it um, going to authenticate the device and store the instance variable right there. So we have this information is pulled out of server view here here to look at the instance and its actual ID, which is right there for the four bytes and so on and so forth. Um, one of the other things, the last thing I want to show when I'm running all the feature is uh, this one right here is um, how to manually set the meter mode. There's a module for this. You can actually just kind of essentially the lower level down the line right there is that uh, we're going to run the feature to set the meter mode to skip false that this is not a manufacturing test um, procedure and uh, set it to uh, false and allow this to accept set the meter mode to uh, do so that trains all this and at this point now we're going to run the get info module again and see if we can still read from the table and we can't read from the table down there because the meter has lost itself and those tables are no longer accessible because the meter's mode is There's also just a paper with even longer sheets that also include this part of the table. And that's it. That's all that. Um, I want to give a uh, thank you to uh, Jake Dahl. He's helped me do a lot of this. He has um, a few other sessions and things that are up and running right now. Um, he's helped me with a lot of technical assignments. And then um, John Weber, who actually also has done a lot of this research um, as well. But he ran into problems with the vendors who were doing stuff in the past few things. So he could not release this to the public. I want to point out that there is also a uh, magician who also does a lot of things in the community as well. He's publicly involved there. John Weber was uh, able to do some of this stuff. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you.